Welcome to the land of the long white cloud, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Today, the Leg 7 departure from Auckland to Itaji, Brazil. From Queenstown to the Coromandel, with over 600 islands, Kiwis have sailing and adventure flowing through their veins. A breathtakingly beautiful city and a country that has seen some of the closest and most dramatic battles in sailing history. Legends like Sir Peter Blake, Sir Russell Coote, Grant Dalton, and the new generation, Peter Burling and Blair Chuke, to name just a few. Kiwi culture and tradition were on full display. A great couple of weeks with the Viaduct Basin packed with race fans. A light wind but action-packed in-port race ensured everyone was entertained, coming back for more for the final send-off. I'm privileged to be joined down here in the Viaduct in Auckland by Sports Broadcaster of the Year, sailing legend and voice of yachting, Peter Montgomery. PJ, uh, just tell us, you've been commentating on the Volvo Ocean Race since its inception, 1973, 45 years. What's changed? A lot has changed and a lot remains the same. Mostly the elements, of course, and what they're going to undertake on this leg to Cape Horn and to Brazil. It'll be similar to what happened back in 73 because nature and the elements are still the same but different. But certainly the boats and the people sailing have changed a lot. Here in 2018, we have professional crews and uh, Grand Prix boats with little or no creature comforts. Back then, I was impressed in Sydney that there was a lot of uh, adventurers, really, and people almost misfits. Uh, Rob James's boat, Second Life, uh, there were a whole bunch of guys maybe having a midlife crisis, and uh, they were having this adventure around the world. And from that very first edition, then the level stepped up, and very definitely by edition three, the, the standard really lifted, notably with uh, flyer Connie van Ruschoten, who won the race for the second time, and Ceramco New Zealand, Peter Blake. And the professionalism and the standard started to go from there. And then once it became the Volvo race, then it really became a professional event. Now, this race has uh, gone to the heart of New Zealand, and New Zealand has reciprocated. Why has this country taken it so much to itself? The first time the Whitbread then, now the Volvo, came to New Zealand was edition two in 1977 and Condor was the first boat coming in uh, to New Zealand uh, and uh, it really uh, lit a, struck a, a light and, uh, with so many New Zealand sailors who wanted to be part of it and so the next edition three there were two New Zealand flag boats, Ceramco New Zealand Peter Blake and Outward Bound Digby Taylor and subsequently since then there have been many New Zealand flag boats and skippered and there's nearly 200 New Zealand sailors who have participated in this event out of the just over 2,000 of all sailors uh, in this edition up until edition 13. There's something uh, about the New Zealand psych that's been attracted to the adventure, the competition, and Auckland, of course, being a maritime city with such Britain, uh, magnificent resources from sail makers, spa makers, and everything you need for these boats uh, is an ideal stopover to prepare for the big, big show coming up towards Cape Horn and beyond. Well, thanks very much to Peter Montgomery, the voice of yachting, and here we are in the viaduct. Over a month ago, the boats left Hong Kong for a dramatic leg all the way down here to Auckland. For a look back, let's go catch up. Here we go, the start of leg six from Hong Kong to Auckland, New Zealand. Leg six, First one of the line, 6,200 uh, miles to go. Good. Yeah, guys. Yeah, I think in the upcoming 24 hours we'll see a gradual build up to uh, 25, 30 knots. Pretty really bumpy. Oh, it's really fun. Sending <laughs> it to Auckland. It's dangerous. Dangerous. No hand lead. Heart rate's through the roof. Everyone's still very close. It's a bit of firm. Get a nose cage. I can read X and over the mainsail, right there. And unfortunately we got caught in night winds and they didn't. We're just quick. We've got the two red boats in our sights. We'll catch them. Coming to get you. Uh, yeah, it's great to be back on board. 
No, it's not. It's been pretty full on. And you've got a lot of spray. So everyone's sort of hanging together. Yeah, it's just not very pleasant. Clearly, water on deck, probably the most water I've seen. I've never seen boats like this. They are just so wet. So, not much sleep. The cookie monster there to get nailed by the way. I'm struggling to find my sea legs. That's your racer. It's really close with my place. Oh, what's funny is lots of boats are following us. If you're with a red boat, you must be doing all right. But uh, what they don't know is that we don't know where to go. Zealand's over there, and we're going over here at the moment. This feels wrong. The whole thing's just smoke and mirrors. I think navigators make it up so they can charge me money. Really, it's just a bunch of free pictures. It's a whole thing of bullshit, to be honest. I didn't know whether this lake having two navigators would be a help or a hindrance. They've worked really well together, and I think basically it's really kept us on the case. but he should have left that behind him. Nothing wrong with it, mate. You're looking good. Thanks. You lost the drone. <laughs> no way. In the dark rooms! It's a bit of a shake out through this one. I'm pretty sure we're at the back of the fleet now. The shit show. Matt Frio, just absolutely having one. We're nearly last. It's about free. <laughs> Now it's uh, roll the dice time. It's glassy at the moment, it's like a mirror. I get sunburned, I get sweaty, dehydrated. To lose to him, we're not following our plan. Ding dong battle. We are in a front. Yes. Very disappointing. KP! Help! Best pressure? We are away. The bungee has snapped between us. Oh yeah, officially last. Go shot the world, go shot the world, go shot the world, go shot the world. Interesting split. And it's all about who can get to that new win first. We're just retaking the lead. Yeah, nerves are on the edge. We've got Manfrey right here. The world's greatest sailor has got eight knots going nowhere, Peter. Ooh. Leave nothing left in the tank, they can all sleep when we get to Auckland. Yeah, I'm stressed, I'm not stressed out. Yeah. You don't want to lose. We're leading and then they were leading and then we were leading and then they were leading and then we were leading. Trust we don't bear an intense as an understatement. The two fastest guys in the fleet bearing down on us. They are not far away. No justice in that. I'm a little bit nervous. They just said. You're feeling good at the moment. Got a small lead. Okay, let's take a look at the scoreboard. In seventh place, it's Turn the Tide on Plastic. In sixth, Team Brunel. In fifth, Vestas 11th Hour Racing on 23. Team Axo Nobel also on 23. The tie broken by the Import Race Series. In third, Team Sung Hung Kai Scallywag on 26. Dongfong Race Team on 34. And Map Frey on 39. Significantly, 48 points have already been raced for. 56 are still up for grabs. This the double point Southern Ocean leg with a bonus point for the first team around Cape Horn. From the start, it's two rounds up and down the Waitamata Harbour. Then it's the longest leg of the race, 7,600 nautical miles of the roughest and most treacherous ocean in the world. Leaving Auckland, the fleet head east and then south, running with the low pressure systems that prowl around Antarctica. There'll be big waves, big breeze, and icebergs. The ice exclusion zone 
well south of the Roaring Forties, touching 59 degrees south. Once across this vast expanse of ocean, they'll have to negotiate the legendary Cape Horn, where the power of the South Pacific slams into South America. Then they turn north, traversing the coast of Argentina, Uruguay, and finally to Itagi, Brazil. This is what it's all about, you know, Auckland, around Cape Horn, you know, to Brazil. It's the most important leg in this race, for sure. It's one of the three big legs with the double pointer, even another, another point around Cape Horn. It's the most dangerous, uh, or, you know, the more risky leg for having uh, any kind of trouble or, or accident or breakage. Tougher start where you go to the cold, the big sea. Inevitable, you're going to get nailed by some some weather system before you get there. Deep, low pressure systems, you know, big waves. You know, you get about a quarter of the way across and you, uh, you know, you look back off the transom of the boat and you realize at that point you're pretty committed to South America because the prospect of slogging back upwind to Auckland doesn't look great. A lot of sailors set off to go around the world and never make a Cape Horn rounding. That's the Cape Horn is always magic. Of course, happy to go, but a lot of stress on this leg. You know, Cape Horn is, uh, you know, one of the three great capes and probably the most iconic. You know, fewer people have rounded it and uh, people have summited Mount Everest. So it's going to be a bit of a game again to be conservative and keep everything in one piece, crew and boat, but at the same time uh, push in the right moments. Blomfen is going to push more than he did there. Let's see if uh, teams like Axe Nobel, Brunel, Escaliwa, they are uh, really, you know, ready to, to fight for this leg. Well, just moments ago, we had the traditional flag handover. We had the Nati Fatua giving the ceremonial blessing of the fleet. Quite an emotional moment down on the dock. And I tell you, the Kiwis really know how to send off a race. Crowds in their thousands, knowledgeable, each and every one of them. It was quite a scene. We had friends and family all down the dock and a lot of Kiwi fans sending off their ocean heroes down to the water here we go just moments to go to the start and we can see now right off the Waitemata harbor right off the viaduct two minutes and five seconds i'm joined in the commentary booth by the voice of reason amongst the world of chaos sally barkow <laughs> sally give us your thoughts here thanks for having me andy i mean it's uh, what a beautiful day we have the excitement the energy amongst the crowds but the weather as well, we've got, you know, 15 knots and just the, the sailors are just going to be delighted. Right, beautiful, huh? 15 to 18 knots inside the harbour and uh, looks like more like uh, 20 to 25 outside. That's going to be a wake up call for all these sailors after the joys of Auckland. For sure, you know, they've had a nice uh, two weeks off, should be well rested, but in their gear they're ready for that big wind. OK, on board here with Matt Frey, 1 minute 22 to go to the start. And uh, as you can see, they're all just getting ready, all of the boats just positioning themselves. And crucial, really, Sally, uh, crucial that you get a good start, you get off to a decent start, because the boats are so close, particularly in this new one design fleet. Yeah, and they have, looks like, an upwind beat, so they're going to be really fighting for their clear lane off this start. OK, one minute to go now. We can see all of the boats just getting themselves prepped. Axon Nobel a little behind the eight ball there on port coming in. And uh, everyone just getting themselves towards the start line. On board Dongfong race team right now, Charles Cordrelier driving. A little bit early, 43 seconds to go, and that's why they're slowing down right there, Sally. Slowing down and trying to keep their windward gaps. They're trying to stay off the boats to leeward, let Brunel come through so that when they do accelerate, they aren't stuck in any bad air. 30 seconds, 30 seconds to go. Tension building, anticipation high. Team Axo Nobel going around the back of the fleet. They've got to get their act together. 20 seconds to go. Matt Frey leading just a little bit of tide against them, I think, right now. And it looks like a push out there on the boat. All the way to Lewitt. Here we go. Eight seconds to go. Vestas have got to tack out. Real tight at the pin. Well, here they go, the one they want to win, but the leg the sailors fear the most around Cape Horn to Itoji, Brazil. Great start from Matt Frey, great start from Dong Fong. Great start in the end from Axo Nobel on port. Got around the outside of everybody. Matt Frey nailed the pin, right? 
They did, you know, and they did a good job in this timing with the tide against them. Quite hard to actually slow the boat down and accelerate at the right time. I think that's why Axe Noble made an easier choice for themselves just to hang up and, and split from the fleet there and, and lead out to the right side of the course. Down to our man on the water, Nick Bice, give us the latest. <laughs> if anyone thought they were going to go a little conservative on this stuff, that... That got a nice fleet now happening, so uh, interesting to see what the breeze brings for them. Okay, let, let's go up to the helicopter. We've got Richard Mason, a four-time veteran of the Volvo Ocean Race, in the helicopter. What say you, Richard Mason? Oh, a fantastic start. It's all on, and it's a beautiful breeze coming down here. It'll be very interesting to see how these boats on the left, Maffrey, they're going to have to tack as soon as they come up alongside the exclusion zone. It'll be uh, all on between Maffrey, Brunel, and Dong Fong there. It looks to me from up here like the left-hand side going up the Devonport Wharf. That's going to be the favoured side. But uh, absolutely fantastic start and uh, plenty of wind out to sea. These, uh, these guys are going to get a big wake-up call when they go around the corner. It looks breezy from up here. And great, Richard. We can see you there in the helicopter. Beautiful pictures. And uh, just tell us also, uh, it's, it looks like Matt Frey have got a cool room. There could be a rules incident here as they come towards the spectator fleet. Richard. Yeah, absolutely. They're coming right on the edge. Here they go. They're going to attack now. Uh, they have the rights here to core water. We can see all three boats going over now. So that'll be a lovely game for them. Uh, now they want to get the bow down and go as fast as they can, see if they can work over the top of Brunel there and uh, bow. It'll be a good stack up here. And Charles is going to try and work up underneath them and uh, close the gap. So lots to play for on the left-hand side. And, of course, on the right-hand side here, We've got Ax and Nobel leading in uh, underneath the ship here, and it looks like they'll run out of breeze in a second, so we'll see these boats coming out of the right too, so fantastic. Wonderful. Great to get Richard's perspective. We'll be going back up to him in the helicopter to get his uh, bird's eye view, and uh, he's certainly no Kiwi. He's flying here today, so uh, the Kiwi, the flightless bird. Uh, we've got Richard Mason in the helicopter. Matt Frey look like they're putting the bow down to try and get over their two opposition there, Brunel and Dong Fong. What does that mean, Sally? They sure are. They're actually pushing their boat speed. So they're hitting 11 threes, 11 five, 11 six, which is just a, like a fast forward mode. So if they can basically shut the door on Brunel and uh, Dong Fang, then they're gonna be leading their group out of the left. And as Richard said, left looks quite strong against the other side of the course. Talk to us about the dirty air that comes off the sails right now. Brunel's starting to suffer. Yes, yeah, so you can see Brunel just coming back. So there's two two spots of dirty air, one off the back of Map Free to Leward and one off the, the top of Dong Feng, if you will, to windward. So Brunel kind of get the squeeze. We call it the sandwich sometimes. And you get basically just shut out the back. Well, Bicey down on the water. Brunel having to tack out of that bad situation. Give us an update. He did a pretty nice job just to kind of be relatively even the guy. But I can see Tider looking pretty good here in the right. Of course, we've got the two red boats that I you what they could be separated by more than that for the next 7,000 miles. They just love each other. Oh, well, we've got a very close incident coming right here, and Bicey just going in and out a little bit on the, the reception, so uh, we will try and clear him out a little bit there. Sun Hun Kai Scallywag on starboard, so they have right of way, but it looks like the two red boats, the current leaders in first and second overall on the points with 39 and 34 are just crossing, but look at this. Turn the tide on plastic. Let's go up to Richard Mason to call across. Our turn the tide on plastic. Going to get them. I think uh, the red boats are going to cross. Tell us, Richard. Yeah, yeah, and no, it looks like they're uh, getting a little bit of left hand in the breeze here at the moment. So Maffrey and Dong Fong clear cross. Uh, coming up to a crucial moment, though, because both those boats will want to tack pretty soon and cover the fleet coming back over the left hand side, so the Devonport side of the harbour. I'd be interested to see how far they push over here because um, the left hand side is going to pay as you get up the top here. And you these two are squeeze, squeezing up. And these two are the leaders in the fleet right now. No surprise that Matt Frey are sti sticking to uh, Dong Fong like a cheap, a cheap suit on date night. It, it really, really close. Yeah, really close. Interesting to watch them matching the boat speed too. The, they'll uh, be wanting to start look over their shoulders pretty soon. I, I'd imagine on Dong Fong there'll be a bit of chat going over to Maffrey thinking they should tack, you know, they won't want to lose their early advantage uh, so they can stay clear as they get to the top of the course. And do you think, Richard, that Matt Frey are trying to push Dong Fong back already with only minutes after the start, they're trying to push them back into the fleet? Well, absolutely, a metre's a metre in yacht racing. They'll be uh, taking everything they can get. What they might try and do is push them right in over onto the wharf here 
and uh, just you know, see if they can peel them into a bit of dirty breeze and then tack back over. So they're looking great. And of course, we've got these other boats splitting over. And Axel Nobel now heading over to uh, to the right-hand side of the track with them. So it's, it's looking pretty good. Brunel's a good indicator here as to how things are looking on the other side. Brunel ducking underneath uh, Vestas 11th Hour Racing and turn the title plastic because Brunel are on port and that is uh, the give way position in sailing. Starboard has the right of way and you can see lots of uh, rigid inflatable boats uh, close behind the boats and those are the umpires. So we have on the water umpiring until the boats leave from North Head and they make sure that if there's an incident between the two boats, you can pull up a flag. Sally, is that right? And what happens after that? That's right. So you pull up a red flag, and then the umpires make a decision, and they either penalize the boat that was in the wrong, or they give you a green flag indicating no penalty. And it's quite a nice way to keep the keep the, the dialogue out of the protest room. So everything is just uh, right on the water there and um, really fast to make a decision, and then you can just carry on with the race. Right, particularly when it's so, such close quarters racing like this. Exactly, and I think it just makes more excitement. You know, you know the you know the incident right in the moment, and you could do something about it, and you can carry on. Okay, well, here we go. Matt Frey, Lee Dongfong, and then it's Brunel, Axo Nobel, but Brunel ducked underneath Vestas 11th Hour Racing and turned the tide on plastic. So when those two come back from the left-hand side. It's going to be close because Brunel, only a boat length behind Dongfong right now. That's right, and we saw Brunel have to hitch back out to the left there, and they didn't lose so much. I mean, they were in between Dongfang and Mapfri, so maybe they've lost, like, you know, three or four boat lengths with the extra tack, which you would expect. But I think, you know, I think Richard was right from the beginning. We're going to see gains from the left all the time here. Gains from the left all the time. And we'll go up to Richard Mason. We'll ask him about the tide. What is the tide doing right now out on the water, Richard? Yeah, the tide's still in the very end of its ebb, so it's still going out just a little bit. That's why it's been said a bit bumpy. I think it was about uh, another 20 minutes to go of uh, outgoing tide, and then we'll see it change direction and start coming in. We'll know when that happens, because the water will go a bit flatter, and that'll affect uh, when the boats come back out the second time, they'll really want to be working the edges to get out of the tide. So we'll see the game change a little bit. See Maffrey doing a lovely job here at covering the fleet. Be interesting to see they start positioning themselves coming into the top mark. They're going to start looking at the right hand side of the racetrack a little bit more. Okay, well we've got Team Brunel coming in from that right hand side, and they were on they're on starboard, so Sun Hunkai Scallywag have decided to tack early to avoid that coming together and any kind of incident. But it's going to get close here on the right hand side. Let's keep eyes on the prize here. Brunel just ducking under Dong Fong. Nick Bice down on the water. Tell us the latest. Yeah, they, uh, I mean, they probably spread out a little bit now, just the fleet, and they're uh, getting pretty close to this top mark, ready for a rounding, um, and then make their way back down to just showcase to this fantastic crowd um, so on such a beautiful day. Big uh, well big done to all everyone involved here in New Zealand. Yeah, big spectator fleet down there by sea, and uh, plenty of your partners and suppliers for the Volvo Ocean Race uh, down there taking out customers and clients. Okay, Sun Hung Kai Scallywag right there. We've got good pictures of them as they try and keep their boat speed up. They are on starboard tack going through the middle of the race course. David Witt, very familiar with close quarters action. And it looks like that right-hand side might have just squeezed ahead a little bit as Matt Frey and Dong Fong head out towards the right-hand side. Remember, it is two laps around here for the spectators and a huge spectator fleet that has accumulated in Auckland. Everybody in New Zealand has a boat and a lot of them out on the water today enjoying this beautiful sunshine, amazing backdrop and such history of the Volvo Ocean Race in New Zealand. Remember, the Volvo has visited New Zealand 11 times, Auckland 10 of those times, Wellington once in 0. 506 was uh, Wellington and the first time the race stopped here in Auckland was the second edition 77 78 and it has been a stalwart stopover ever since because it's the gateway to the Southern Ocean the one the sailors really want to win but it gives them as much competitive as it does fear of incredible seas and these low pressure systems that just barrel around the south of the planet 
and they go from west to east, and that's where they pick up these big breezes and shoot towards Cape Horn. Oh, look at that, North Head, beautiful, what a scene. And they've got, <laughs> look at that, uh, Kiwis doing what they do best, getting out there, folding chairs and their bicycles and having a picnic. Friends and families of all, and they've been coming here since the very first race. And some of that archive footage that we saw earlier in the show just gives you an idea of how the race has changed, but how it stays the same, as PJ Montgomery said, spectators enjoying this moment and it really speaks to the ki the kiwi sort of uh, the kiwi mentality of adventure of pioneering spirit which they do so well up in the helicopter i think we've got the view from the helicopter right now richard mason beautiful scene oh absolutely magic and we've got the history out here steinlager too she's reaching up and down the harbor at the moment in full glory in full dress and uh, then on the inner harbor there we've got a fantastic battle going on just going over the top of a wonderful crowd here in North Head. They uh, really do it well, these uh, Kiwis. We've got to love them. <laughs> and, uh, looks, looks like uh, we've got everything to play for over here. Uh, these guys coming up on the, on the boundary. I'm seeing quite a bit of tide in the middle of the harbour here as well. So uh, it's going to be very, very close at the top mark. Vestas could be quite strong coming in here. So it's, uh, I think we've, it's going to be super tight as we line up here. And Richard, it uh, looks like Turn the Tide on Plastic have done a really nice job of getting out of the start and uh, punching hard in the start of this race. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it looks like they're, uh, they're going to cross ahead here a little ways away, but, uh, oh no, they're dipping, dipping hard. So there we go, Maffrey, uh, we're oh. just pointing at them. So they're around the back oh. of Maffrey. Oh, so big close. duck. So big. close. Yeah, Fantastic. huge yeah. duck. And Turn the Tide on Plastic, and, yeah, have come right back into it almost. Uh, they almost got around the leaders, Matt Frey, the big duck, and now they've had a slight issue there with their jib. They need to wind on. That is just on the left-hand side of your screen. There'll be some tired muscles on board already, but well done to them as they get right right in it, chewing the bone. It is brilliant sailing here, and what a, what a scene for everybody here in Auckland. Love it, love it. Okay, down on the water. Nick Bice, did you see that duck on Turn the Tide on Plastic with Matt Frey? Talk us through it. Well, there, there are some nervous people both on Matt Frey and on Turn the Tide. <laughs> and as you say, there's going to be some sore muscles, but uh, that'll soon be uh, whipped away when they're about to get around the top mark here and send it downwind and just to turn it on for this fantastic Kiwi crowd. Right, and Bicey, you, just, you definitely don't want the boats to get too close as much as the competitive spirit and you suddenly see red. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to touch the boats here, right? No, that's right. But uh, in saying that, we haven't packed the boatyard up just yet, just in case. <laughs> OK, well, it's a ding-dong battle out here on the Waitamata Harbour. It is beautiful racing and a scene for everyone. Vestas crossed over the front of Dong Fong. Vestas now crossing over Brunel, Charlie Enright and his crew, and they've got a special guest on board with them, Roy Disney Jr., who was one of their longest standing and most committed supporters for the... Uh, for their early project, Sally, just talk to us about that uh, that project they did. Yeah, that was uh, really early on in Charlie and Mark's career, and they had the Morning Light Project, the Transpac race, and did a fantastic job learning the ropes as as skippers and, and what it takes to, to build an offshore team and, and have the support you need. And they pretty much carried that into their first Volvo Ocean race. Yeah, that was with Alva Medica, and interestingly, Alva Medica in the last edition of this race won. Uh, the, they were first around Cape Horn in this leg and they really did an amazing job. Can they repeat it after being out for the last couple of legs since Hong Kong? Can Vestas 11th Hour Racing get the foot right back on the gas and get back into the race? Here's Matt Frey getting towards the windward mark. It's been back and forth, and we've had pretty, pretty much everybody somewhere up the front of the fleet, but Matt Frey have just managed to eke out their lead as we get towards the windward mark. Just a quick update, Nick Bice. Yeah, no, they... Uh... I think they've just taken the foot off just a little bit here, but you can just see that prowess of Matt Frey, how they just do everything nice and easy, nice and conservative, and they'll see themselves around the mark and uh, pop the big A3 and send it back down to uh, turn on the show as they've all been promising to do. With a spectacular backdrop first around the windward mark for the leg departure to Itoji, Brazil, it's Matt Frey. They go in second place. It's Vestas 11th Hour Racing. 
great start for these guys. Brilliant sailing. And third around the Windward Mark, Dongfong race team. Great listening on board. Fourth around the top mark, it's Brunel. Fifth, turn the tide on plastic. Sixth, around the windward mark, Axo Nobel. And seventh, Sun Hun Kai Scallywag. Wow, just talk to us about the sails and what they're dealing with right now, Sally. Yeah, so it looks like at most boats are called for an early jibe here, which makes it a little bit tricky. They need to actually bear away, make sure that the big A3 or masthead, whichever one they've gone for, is on the lock, the tacks down, complete the jive, get the runner on, and deploy. So that's why you're seeing, you know, a little bit of later deployment on most boats. Uh, looks like Turn the Tide is apt to drop their jib. Hopefully they haven't had a breakage there. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough maneuver, as you can see. Here we go with Sun Hung Kai Scallywag as they come around the top mark. We're going to see them unfurl that. I think they'll go for the jibe and then unfurl. Masthead zero, sorry. Is that yeah, it looks like the masthead zero with yeah. the fully painted. Yeah, there we go. Matt Frey have just carried on a little bit and they've done a great job of extending their lead. Let's get the perspective from up in the helicopter, Richard Mason. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing watching them go around the top mark here in this breeze. You've got to remember on these types of boats, normally you're racing a boat like this with at least 14 to 18 crew if we're doing maxi worlds. These, these guys are out here, guys and girls, doing it with average of 10 crews. So they're, they're hands short, the way they manoeuvre these boats around and throw them around the racetrack. I mean, you know, what other sport in the world do you have to do a sprint race and then go out and do one of the most epic marathons in the world? So, I mean, a lot going on out here, lots of nerves. Uh, they're getting control of themselves and getting into the battle. They'll do as many jives and tacks going up and down Auckland Harbour as they could do in the entire leg to Itajai once they go around Colville. So, uh, it's, it's all to play for out here. Fantastic stuff. So boat handling a real challenge. That's the latest from Richard Mason. Thanks from that up in the helicopter on board with Matt Frey. Juan Vila there looking at his iPad. He's not playing Candy Crush, I can tell you that. He is making sure that they are within the boundaries. He's making sure that they've got a ley line into the bottom mark, and that's a ley line. That's not something that you get at Stonehenge. Tell us what that is, Sally. <laughs> a ley line is, uh, yeah, basically what is the, if you maneuver the boat, so the next jibe, if they can make, if they can lay the actual mark without jibing again. So it's the line they'll take uh, after they make the maneuver, and you'll see, We'll see if, the, I'm not sure they'll make it all the way down in one jibe, but um, yeah, they'll be trying to jibe and then push as low as they can so they don't have to do too many more jibes. And in, the, in this breeze, real challenging boat handling here, and Dong Fong look like they've got the bit between the teeth. And Matt Frey, a little bit of a wobbly jibe there, right? They didn't quite, they had quite a big release on their, on, on the, on the uh, original sheet. It did look like that, and it's it's quite key the timing of the of all six pedestals when you're really putting the hammer down and putting the power in, uh, how the the driver's going to turn the boat compared to the release of the sheet, and it can go really well, or it can be a little bit trickier like that last one was for Mapfre. And Dong Fong right back into the map fray. They haven't let them get away, and that just that shaky jibe on map fray, very unusual has allowed Dong Fong to get right back into them. Look how close it is, and Dong Fong decide they're going, whoa, look how much faster Dong Fong are going. They've created an overlap just to lure of Matt Frey. Let's listen in. Wow, they've only just finished the jibe. <laughs> the breeze on the race course. Look at the darker patches of water. Long way to go to the pin mark. That's the next mark that they're going to go around. That's the lured mark. And then it's a beat back up wind to the departure gates as they leave. OK, let's go down to the water. Uh, Nick, ba Nick Bice, really t titanic tussle between these two top teams here. Matt Frey and Dong Fong. Bicey, give us the update. Oh, the, the two red boats, they absolutely love it. But what's interesting here is both Axe Nobel and Scallywag went for the masthead zeros, while all, all the other boats went for the A3. But I do notice there's also an issue on Vestas 11th hour. They still haven't deployed 
either a Masthead Zero or an A3. Not entirely sure what that issue is, but let's hope it's not going to, to uh, hold them back for the rest of this leg. Well, Bicey, I went out sailing with them on Thursday and they were doing all of these systems checks. They were making sure the reefing was all working, the halyards were all working, and that's what you've got to do when you get back into the race, Bicey, but uh, maybe a slight issue uh, early doors. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they would have checked, double-checked, triple-checked, but unfortunately, with the pressure of racing, sometimes things do go wrong. So uh, hopefully they can... Uh, they can get back on top here in not too much time at all. And Bicey, just talk to us about Di Cafari, Turn the Tide on Plastic. Is he driving right now? But they, uh, that's one question I've got, and they seem to be absolutely right on it here, putting them under big pressure. Yeah, crew manoeuvre point of view, as Richard said, you normally sail these boats with 14 to 18 people. Um, on Dee's boat, she has 10 crew, so... In theory, they can do a lot more or be a bit more efficient in the manoeuvres, whereas all the other teams have nine crew. So that might be give her a little nice little leg up. But uh, we're, I'm, I'm definitely enjoying seeing them at the front of the fleet. Yeah, well done, Dee. Dee is driving, and uh, she's doing a blooming good job of it. Right in the hunt here, in third place right now. Turn the tide on plastic, and that'll be good because they've got their, the boss of the Mirpuri Foundation, Paolo Mirpuri, and uh, he's on there today as one of their leg jumpers. We, we're going to see a few of those leg jumpers. Let's go up to the helicopter for the latest from Richard Mason. Richard. I'm just running the race stats up here. We're on Jive 5 on Dong Fong already. And they're only halfway down the harbour. So it's uh, a lot of work going in from the crews here. They'll be going absolutely flat out. They'll get about two seconds of rest and then they'll have to stand by for the next dive. Be interesting to see here, we've got Brunel just driving over onto starboard on the left-hand side of the harbour. As they get that under control and get it going, it'll be, uh, be very interesting to see where they place up against Turn the Tide, which we've got over on the other side of the harbour. Absolutely fantastic view. And of course, you've got to think a little bit here, you know, they've got thousands and thousands of miles to go in some of the most remote parts of the world. And, if, and right now, they could do all the damage in here. So it's all about risk management down there. You've got to keep it all together. Yeah, and we've had uh, amazing scenes for the Kiwis. We've had plenty of Kiwi boats, as you were talking about, Richard Steinlager two in 89-90, New Zealand Endeavour, 93-94 with Grant Dalton. He won the maxi division. And Ross Field won in 93-94 in the Whitbread 60 division at the time. And Adrian Amro won, obviously, with Mike Sanderson. You know a few of those... Uh, you know a few of those sailors, and it, it really is a significant part of Kiwi sailing history, Richard. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, we were very fortunate uh, last week that we, we were able to arrange a little get-together for all the legends that have taken in this race over the years from, uh, from New Zealand. And uh, we had some of the crews from uh, Outward Bound, uh, Ceramco New Zealand. We've got Pippa Blake out on the water here today. Of course, that was uh, Peter Blake's first attempt at skippering a, a race by himself. Uh, a lot of other people like Mike Quilter uh, that have you know, they've gone and navigated around the world. So uh, Kiwi sailors, this is this is really the home. This is where we all cut our teeth on the wider matter. This is where we learned our craft. And many of us picked up other skills in the marine industry here and uh, culminated in the opportunity to race around the world. So this really is very much a birthplace and firmly built into the DNA of New Zealand. It wasn't that long ago, mate. It was the only way to get out of the country. <laughs> so we all had to sail anyway. <laughs> and uh, Richard, I saw someone at that Legends event who had a Flyer 2 shirt on, the winners of uh, uh, the second edition of the race in 77-78. Uh, Amazing. Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, Peter McCommentary's comments through the night was the most impressive thing that was... Uh, most of the guys there can still fit their shirts, so uh, a tribute to all the boys who keep themselves in shape. Very good. Well, pictures on Brunel, and this gives you an idea of how fast the boats are going. Look at that, Sally, tell us. Yeah, they're really smoking along here. You see quite a lot of pressure funneling down the harbour, and each puff is accelerating them more and more. Yeah, look at that, and it looks like uh, Vestas 11, uh, turn the tide on plastic there, right of screen, and team Brunel coming together. Looks like it's going to be a real close incident. Great pictures on the helicopter. We've got uh, uh, Adam Brown up there in the helicopter with his AMI Productions doing a brilliant job. Turn the tide on plastic. Just going behind team Brunel. But that's uh, 
sort of pretty much neck and neck because you lose a boat length or two at least in these jives, maybe more going at this speed, Sally. That's right, and you can assume that Turn the Tide now is on the long jive into the mark, so Brunel's going to have to go, yeah, just a few more boat lengths so that they don't have any bad air off the back, and it's all going to be about, you know, if, if Brunel can basically catch, catch them on the inside of the mark. Okay, there we're with Team Brunel right now. Thanks to everyone watching from all around the world. It's great to have you all here on Facebook Live and uh, all of the other uh, channels we've got on Twitter as well. And just let us know where you're watching from and comments and questions, always welcome. Here we go, this sets us up here. The lured mark, mark number two, right across from, uh, from Devonport. And that is Matt Frey leading over Dongfong race team but it's very close, and that's the crowd on North Head enjoying a spectacular afternoon here in Auckland, sun shining. Look at the pace, the rib at uh, full chat, trying to keep up with Matt Frey doing uh, 15, 16 knots right there, Sally. Yeah, I mean, it's super nice flat water and puffy, as I said, so it's just, yeah, the boats are just pumping along. Dong Fong, the two red boats. Dong Fong on the left, Matt Frey on the right. Putting, being put under a little bit of pressure by Turn the Tide on Plastic and Brunel. Towards the back, we've got Axo Nobel, we've got Vestas 11th Hour Racing and Sun Hung Kai Scallywag. Vestas look like they've sorted out their masthead issue and they're back in on board with Dong Fong. Let's listen in. You always know when they're out of breath because you can't hear a thing. All you yeah. can hear is the puffing and panting uh, uh, like, like out of breath dogs, absolutely trying to get that oxygen right on in. Yeah, it's one of the biggest grinds you get to do, the big A3 jive, and you have to push it all together in order to get it in efficiently, or as soon as it fills, it's just gonna take ages. Incident coming up here between Brunel and Dong Fong. Brunel on the charge. Big gains. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, Dong Fong are going to have to go behind Brunel. But they're going to have to head up a bit to do it, so the boat will heel over a little bit. Here we go. That's Marie Ryu. She, she, she does a lot of chat on the boat, Sally. Mm. I think she's calling a lot of the pressure and the angle, and making sure that they're all... It's a lot of chat, isn't it? They're all, they're all really, you can just sense they're all really working together. J1, there's Willie, El, Willie Altadil and Nieti right there. Yeah. Nieti is back on board after an injury uh, back in, uh, in, in Lisbon, wasn't it? When he, uh, when he slipped and hurt his back. Great to have him back on board for Nieti and he's got a huge following of fans in Spain. Hello to all of them. I'm sure they're all watching, enjoying. Vamos Map Frey is their hashtag. And there they are, beautiful pictures. Putting under uh, Brunel, putting them under pressure. And the umpire boat right behind them. Here we go, mark number two. The lured mark. Just off the West Haven and the viaduct scene of so much sailing stardom made these Kiwi legends in the race and it's great to have so many of the spectators out okay okay let's go down to Nick Bice just give us a quick update before the mark rounding Bicey yeah we see uh, both Brodeo and Matt Frey rolling up their A3s and they'll come back into this mark just under the jib alone but uh, let's not forget about the battle between both Brunel and Matt Frey with uh, Brunel being steered by Pete Burling and got Blair Chuk on Matt Frey. I mean, this is uh, nothing, doesn't get any better for those two guys right here, first and second, um, leaving their home port of Auckland. Well, and we may see a lead change here because Matt Frey and Brunel have decided to roll up their, uh, their masthead sails and Dong Fong are coming in fully arced up here with the big sail up and they might do a jive drop around here. It's gonna be close. Let's keep eyes on. Dong Fong gonna try and squeeze in there, are they? Not gonna quite do it. Wow, exciting racing. So, leading around the lured mark, holding off 
all comers, but it hasn't been easy. Matt Frey. Second around the Lured Mark, Dong Fong race team. Keeping the pressure on, it's Brunel in third. Sailing a super start here in fourth place. Turn the tide on plastic. Dong Fong, slight issue there. Didn't get the jib in. Yeah, it sounded like they had a tangle up on something, but they just sorted it out. Yeah, listening in here on Dong Fong. Plenty of action, and this is going to get them all uh, pretty pretty sweaty yeah. before they get out on in, in into the into the real breeze. Okay, let's go down to Baisi. Give us an update, Baisi. It seems to be all on for young and old around this uh, Watamata Harbour course. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Brunel went quite conservative there and actually dropping the A3 before they uh, before they rounded the mark, whereas everyone else has still got their A3s up and they'll drop them during the upwind. So we'll see how much of a difference that actually makes for Brunel getting, uh, making their way back out here now. Axa Nobel round in fifth. Team Brunel tacking off, not the best tack from Team Brunel. They've slowed right down. It is so challenging, these boats. What a handful getting them around this short course. And as Richard Mason said, it is such a challenge. These boats used to sailing hundreds of miles every day offshore. And now we're asking them to go up and down in essentially a very short, you, you, you wouldn't sail a lot more a, a, a lot shorter course in the uh, Wednesday night rum race here, Richard Mason. No, absolutely not. I mean, basically, the uh, all the boats are sailing the import course that they did last weekend, and uh, then they've got to go straight off the back of that. They're going to go round North Head here, go reaching down the East Coast Bays, and then start beating out towards Colville Channel, uh, which is out on the corner of the Coromandel there. And they'll be in for a little surprise out there. Forecast of uh, up to 40 knots there this afternoon uh, with tide against current. So it could be anywhere up to four to six metre seas out there. It'll be very, very uh, uncomfortable pa passage through there and at uh, the gateway to the Southern Ocean. Well, they have 140 miles across to East Cape. So uh, what they're doing here in front of us is absolutely phenomenal. The skills of these crews is absolutely world class. It's fantastic. And you've got a great view. Just tell us what the breeze looks like up the race course now. This is the final upwind of the inshore part of, of this race. Yeah, and it looks like the breeze is picking up here. More and more uh, sheep in the paddock, as we like to say in New Zealand, uh, commonly referred to as our relatives. But uh, more and more white caps appearing out here. Uh, you can see the water's getting darker, so there's very solid breeze all the way out. So I think we'll see it increasing as they get up to the uh, top mark and start clearing out of the harbour around North Head there. Yeah, OK, well, that's uh, mark number two. We've already been around the windward mark. Then it's a downwind we've had down to mark number two. Now it is an upwind, and they will just pass by the final windward mark before we have two or three marks to get the boats out of the Hauraki Gulf. And it'll be through Rangitoto, past Rangitoto, and we'll get some great scenery there as well. Pictures of Dong Fong with downtown Auckland in the background, Sky City and the... Prince's Wharf right there as Dong Fong tack onto starboard. They've had enough, uh, they can't go any further, otherwise they'll, they'll, they'll hit the solid stuff. And great to see the spectator fleet being quite so uh, 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 pliable. Uh, certainly gives you an impression that uh, Kiwis know, know about racing, right? Yeah, they know what a race looks like, and yeah, they're just staying outside the boundary, quite close to the boundary, because they want to get, you know, the best view they can. But yeah, it's nice that uh, give the space to the racers and let them get out of the harbor. Yeah, and we can hear the, uh, <laughs> we can hear all of the, 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 the boat horns in the background as the boats head off up away from Auckland now. Here we go, on board with Turn the Tide on Plastic. Let's watch one of their taxes. D just slides the boat through the wind. You can't go straight into the wind. Yeah, she's got a big look, big job, this leg, uh, Sally. A lot of responsibility on her shoulders. And they had such an amazing leg 
down into Auckland. They were so unlucky. It was a real heartbreaker for them. They were they were right at the front of the fleet and got past in the final mile, literally in the final miles. Talk us through it. Yeah, it sure was. It was heartbreaking when they came ashore, but I, I think now they look back and they realize that their skills are increasing. They're, they're catching up to the fleet, you know. They had a really young team, not much experience, and now that last leg they showed that they have, they're gaining the experience. They're no longer the kids out there. And I think between that and what they learned in the last Southern Ocean, you can see, I, I, you can just feel the confidence here in D that she's she's driving the boat better than she has in any import race yet. And I think they're going to be off with this lead group. And uh, Bianca Cook sailing with them. She's had a huge amount of media attention here in New Zealand. You know her well. Mm -hmm. to yeah, she's been super busy. Hasn't haven't had much time off like the rest of them. But um, yeah, what a great uh, what a great star in the sport. Super solid sailor on the boat. Does the pit for turn the tide, and what great energy, good personality to have out there. Always team player, always helping everybody else out and pushing the group. And she 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 joins a, a, a very illustrious group of Kiwi uh, female sailors who've done the race before, way back in 89, 90. Uh, Fiona McCorkindale, Christina Murphy, both with Integrity. That was one of the boats. Uh, Leah Fanstone also sailed with uh, the U.S. Women's Challenge, right with Dawn Riley, uh, someone you know well and uh, uh, Bridget Suckling, Sharon Ferris, uh, Karen McMaster, and now Bianca Cook, are a, are a good list of amazing Kiwi female sailors. And we've talked about the, the fact that we have these women now involved in the race, been a real, real boon for the race, and certainly has helped media enormously, particularly down here in New Zealand. Bianca, very eloquent. She is, yeah, and she, she's, oh yeah, very eloquent. She speaks very well. She has a big passion for the sport and her team and, and what the team stands for. And I think that's, um, when you have that sort of voice amongst you, it's refreshing. Yeah, very good. Well, we've talked about some of the Kiwi women sailors and the winning uh, New Zealand men sailors, pretty important as well, of, of, of nine of the sailors who've won the Volvo Ocean Race uh, twice, eight of them Kiwis, and of the three people who've won the, uh, the the race three times, all three of them Kiwis: Mark Christensen, Stu Bannatyne, and Brad Jackson. And Mark Christensen, or I think he was known as Krusty. Uh, he uh, he won on EF Language, Ilbrook, and ABN Amro won, and he he did it three times in a row. Wow! Beat that, right? Yeah, it's quite a record. That's. Uh that's, that's very impressive, and I think it goes to show, as Richard sort of said, you, you learn up sailing here, you know, or you learn, you grow up sailing here, learning how to sail, and it seems like it's in the blood of, of every Kiwi. Oh, look at that. The, the, the moment recorded for posterity in one of the finest ways with pen and paper. Love it. That's on North Head. Oh, that is fantastic. Sky Tower in the background. Magic, magic moments. We'll, uh, we'll talk to that guy later, I'm sure, but... That's beautiful as the, yeah, that's really cool. Dongfeng race team. Yeah, let's go up to the let's go up to the helicopter. Richard Mason, uh, how much would you love to be going into the next uh, 48 hours of 30 knots upwind, 180 miles to uh, the East Cape, and then the Southern Ocean? Do you miss it? Uh, I think I'm at peace with that part of my career, mate. Uh, <laughs> last time I went out of here, we, I, I found myself up to my, my, my waist in uh, freezing cold water a few weeks, a few days out after a rather rough night in uh, Cobble Channel. But no, the heart wants to be out there, and I know what these crews are going through. It's, um, what do they say? You don't really get to live life unless you live outside the box a little bit. And that's what the Volvo race is all about, an extraordinary gathering of uh, wonderful people that are uh, willing to push the limits a bit. Now we've got another race starting up here at the moment. The, uh, the clear water for the boats to sail and is shrinking rapidly as these uh, spectator boats are allowed to break free of the, uh, 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 the, the zones that restrict them and uh, they are charging up the harbour here in a mass of white water to, uh, to get their last glimpses of these boats as they, uh, as they exit out. So a fantastic sight up here. Um, City of sails and full show. Yeah, Richard, what, what, what were your feelings when you were leaving in moments like this? Were you just focused on the racing or was there a moment just to get the feels in your tummy? Oh, no, I mean, uh, it was something that you thought you'd get used to and you never got used to it. Uh, every, it actually got worse as you went on. 
I think the first time you leave Auckland, you've got no idea what you're getting yourself in for, so you're a bit OK. Uh, once you've done the Southern Ocean once or twice, and you know what you're getting yourself in for, uh, you, your view changes a little bit. Lots of nerves, very emotional. You're saying goodbye to the family, you've got sponsor commitments, and then... Oh, the Richard, real the tight race. cross, real tight cross between the two red boats. It's not a cross. Dong Fong have got to duck behind Matt Frey, and that was very close indeed. Here, we're on board with Charles Quadrelier right now. They have made big gains, Dong Fong, back to Matt Frey. Well done to Dong Fong race team. Charles Quadrelier just giving a little uh, shake of his head there to Xavi Fernandez, saying, hey... We got we, we we got you marked. We're coming for you, yeah, and it doesn't matter, right, right? It doesn't matter whether it's right at the start or right at the end. Let's go down to Nick Bice. We we'll see if we can get an update on that. No, okay, Sally. I mean, ama amazing. Dong Fong are going to be at these. They're, they're going to be all, all over these guys, right? Yeah, you can tell they're never. They're not going to let up, and you know they they know what they're in for. And you know maybe it, they could have just done that duck a little bit better. And that's those are the little details that they're going to push for, you know. And that's that's what it's all about out there. Amazing. Wow, that was really close. Those two boats right at the front of the fleet, Matt Frey and Dong Fong, just giving us a sniff of what we can expect in the future. Look at that Kiwi scene, if ever there was. Everyone enjoying a day out. Let's go down on the water and get an idea from Nick Bice. What, what say you, Nick? <laughs> I, I, I must admit, I had a little uh, nervous time there just seeing Dong Fong cross behind Matt Frey. But oh, you can't take anything away from these two red boats. Charles Cordillier and Xavi Fernandez, whilst they joke on shore, they're the fierce of competitors on the water. And uh, what are we going to see next? Maybe Matt Frey on the left will come back and uh, pick up a bit of the game. So uh, we'll stay tuned for that one. Yeah, and Nick, uh, just give us an idea. You've, you've done this race before. You've felt the emotion of having to say goodbye to friends, family and loved ones, uh, not necessarily in that order, on the dock. Uh, t tell us what it's like. Uh, I as Richard said, it's something you definitely don't get used to. And uh, I can agree with Richard, it actually got worse as the race went on. When you start the racing, you've never done it before. You know, you're a little bit naive. You're not sure what you're taking yourself into. But I tell you what, it's brought many a grown man down this this race, standing on the dock saying uh, your farewells to your loved ones. Yeah, there we go. Just a picture of uh, Brown's Island there in the background as uh, the boats now start to head out uh, of the Waitemata Harbour and they're going to next up will be turn left around North Head and then up the Rangitoto Channel. Then they're going to sail or reach basically all along the beaches, uh, Takapuna, uh, Murray's Beach, and uh, then they will finally turn right and go upwind across the Haraki Gulf towards East Cape, 180 miles. I think they're going to go just inside Great Barrier Island. Look at that, yeah, we've got some old salts on uh, North Head, enjoying the scenes. Everyone bicycling up there for a lovely Sunday out. Probably a little pannier full of beers and some, uh, some cheese and ham sandwiches. Sounds ideal. Right? Yeah. What are we, should, we doing here? What are we should be broadcasting <laughs> from up there. <laughs> Right, we could fit we could fit this little uh, this little container in the, on North Head, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're, they're from the helicopter. Look at that, wonderful, absolutely wonderful, beautiful North Head. Defensive village of the Maoris that was back in the day. They used it to spot the uh, marauding invaders, and uh, the Maoris have amazing history here in New Zealand and that's why it was particularly wonderful to see the Nati Fatua doing the ceremonial blessing. They had the World War II defensive harbour as well. I'm not sure New Zealand got too much grief, but uh, uh, it's also, uh, it's also m memorials all around uh, Auckland for the Anzacs and their contribution to uh, World War One and World War II. Amazing stuff. Well, from more serious battle to a, uh, a lighter battle here out on the water it is a battle royale between the two red boats look at them still only a couple of boat lengths in between them and uh, let's go back up to Richard Mason these two seem to be uh, tied at joined at the hip nothing between the two of these red boats right at the front Richard Mason oh absolutely they, they seem to have a rubber band forgive it 
Just remember, thousands of miles to go here, and these guys are giving it absolutely everything over a couple of metres as they come out of uh, the inner wider matter and uh, round uh, North Head. Actually, they're just passing uh, a, a very uh, another fellow Kiwi who was married last night, Ray Davies, uh, winner of the 2001-2002 race on uh, Elbrook and uh, uh, one of the key tacticians involved in the um, last defence of the America's Cup. He was uh, married just in the background there yesterday evening. So uh, oh. celebrations all around for, uh, for for many a whipper and Volvo sailor. Uh, well, congratulations to Razor. Good for him. And uh, he one of the crucial parts of the America's Cup, which is going to come back to Auckland. Not only do they get the Volvo Ocean Race, but they're going to get the America's Cup in a few years' time too. Here we go. Matt Frey looking at them. Now they just looks like they're starting to get sails up on the windward side. This is, there you can see that final windward mark just to the right. So they've gone quite a bit away from the windward mark. They don't need to have a close rounding because they've got to go around two, they've got to go through a little gate just to the left there, which is two red and uh, red and green navigation marks, marks 17 and 18, and then they'll turn left around North Head and up the Rangitoto Channel. On board with Dongfong right now. They got clear air, so Matt Frey directly ahead of them, but only by a couple of boat lengths. Getting everyone getting organised now. This is the moment where you sort of st got to start to get your head down, Sally. Talk to us about this. That's right. You know, so they're they're done with you know sort of the fierce tacking battle, and they need to yeah. The boat starts to get more and more set up for offshore as they go here. They're going to get those sails to windward and crack off and and reach and leg jumpers. Yeah. Leg jumpers here, I think. That looks like someone on the back of Dong Fong. Yeah, that's uh, Guy Haveld, uh, uh, one of the evening news presenters for TV New Zealand. Has helmet on and his yellow dry suit. I, I guess that's a dry suit. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just going to get wet. Lovely tug. The sails now starting to get on the windward side. Why do they put the sails on the windward side, Sally? For those of you that don't know about sailing, uh, tell us. Yeah, it's just to increase oh, the... Oh, here we go, the jumper. We'll just go with uh, with Guy, the news presenter for TV New Zealand. We're going to... Uh, everyone get your marks out because we're going to give oh, him marks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Mason, what marks do you give for that jump out? Tell us. Oh, from up here, it looked like about a seven. Uh, <laughs> not bad, is it? I think that's generous. A seven. <laughs> yeah. he, he got slightly, uh, slightly out of shape on his, uh, on his first two steps. They're going to just pull him in the water there. But it's quite a, it's quite a jolt that you get. When I talked to Wendy Schmidt after she jumped off uh, Vesta's 11th hour racing, she said the jolt of the auto inflation of the, uh, of the life jacket uh, was quite something. Now you got, you have to go through training like this. Uh, that's right. Sally. You have to do a, a full sea survival course. So you jump into a big big pool that's already you know big waves and rough water and um yeah generally those it, those self-inflating life jackets are quite rigid and they can be quite tight around your around your neck as well and so it can be quite shocking which is why you want to make sure you've practiced it before it happens but these guys they probably don't go through that training and they get this luxury and you know special experience to jump off the back of the Volvo ocean yacht before it goes offshore right and you have to do the same with life rafts to to Sally? That's right. We, we uh, practice in the life rafts. You have to be able to flip it over and get in and get out and help an injured person in and out. And you spend some time in it, which uh, the only time I've spent has been, on the, been in, the, in the pool. And I would never wish to spend any amount of time in the ocean. It's, it's quite a small space. Yeah. The Matt Frey jumper, Javier Basilo, is a corporate guest of Matt Frey management team. He's just jumped off the Matt Frey. Make sure when you Look at that, beautiful. What a scene. Okay, we've got the jumper. Oh, it looks like we've got a, yeah, it looks like we've got a, a jumper on Vestas 11th hour racing. Kevin Mayalamu, no less. Absolute legend. Second most capped New Zealand rugby player of all time. And I think the sixth most capped rugby player in the world. And uh, he retired after they won the World Cup in 2015 and uh, he quite quite the man we interviewed him this morning on the dock and he's quite the character was really into being here and jumping off so Kevin Mayalamu many a rugby fan will know that name to conjure with 
now. He's retired, he's into all sorts of educational, community and social responsibility stuff. Here he goes, we're gonna give him, Oi! Oh, very nice! <laughs> oh, that was a good one. <laughs> I mean, off the low side, so if he didn't have the, uh, and his life jacket didn't inflate, check it out. Okay, we'll go up to Richard Mason. What, what, what numbers did he get for that? That looked pretty good, he got, he got a little tuck in there. Yeah, he did. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's called the Kiwi Bomb. It's uh, a technique we use for jumping in pools around here. <laughs> oh, lovely, lovely technique from it. And what a view here as the boats are starting to stretch out. They're really starting to, you know, they're just putting the bows down, starting to see this, get their legs going and see the yellow mark out in the distance there. And right out there in front of them, Steinlager too. She's uh, going round in circles. So it was a fantastic scene. And of course, the, the white mass of spectator boats here phenomenal you, you've got to love bringing the race to a country like this where everyone just loves it i mean even my mother tells me how to sail here <laughs> <laughs> yeah your mother tells you your mother-in-law tells you your granddad certainly tells you he's got the binoculars out i'm sure giving some top tips well on earth didn't you tack on that lift on that header ridiculous anyway uh he was sailing in their blood great to see uh, what's the water temperature like? We've got a question out. It's uh, it's actually reasonably warm. Uh, what is it, about uh, 16, 16 degrees centigrade or so? Uh, I think I'm a little bit guessing there. Sally's, yeah. looking, at, <laughs> Sally's looking at me quizzically saying, hey, anyway, whatever. OK, Sun Hun Kai Scallywag, their jump has just gone over. That was uh, Mark Francis and uh, Matashu uh, Fukumoto, one of their sponsors of uh, FUKU. Look at that, amazing, a sea of boats following them all out. And Rangitoto, the volcano in the background, last erupted only 600 years ago. I'd say it was dormant, but I mean, 600 years, not a long time in geological terms there. Browns Island, just uh, there, up to the right-hand side. That's one of the, that's a Kiwi nature reserve. And when, uh, when people first came to New Zealand, there were only, flight, uh, uh, only flightless birds here because the birds never needed to escape from any predators. So that White's Island, one of the islands that they're getting rid of all the, predat all the predators so that the flightless birds can go back. And the same with uh, Rangitoto and... Uh, uh, no, I've just forgotten the name of the uh, island right behind Rangitoto. It'll come to me in a moment. On board... Sun Hung Kai Scallywag. Okay, well, really, as the boats start to leave Auckland, it's now eyes towards the Southern Ocean. Mark, here, here we go. The final, the final two, the fi some of the final marks there, just on the left-hand side, looking at one of the channel markers. Uh, Nick Bice, we're down to the, we're, we're off towards the Southern Ocean. Tell us what the teams can expect in the Southern Oceans for those of you who've never been there before. Oh, it's, uh, just prior to that, though, I was wondering what marks I was going to give myself as I was about to get jumped out the, chucked out the back of the uh, rib that I'm sitting in. But um, they'll be heading into the Southern Ocean with quite some nerves. For, unfortunately, during this leg in the 0506 race, I actually broke my hand and had to spend the last week before Cape Horn with a broken hand. That doesn't mean you get to uh, go off watch, though. So uh, that was quite an arduous, long leg for myself. But uh, they, as soon as they get around the Cape, they're going to start heading dive south straight away down to 55 south, hang a lefty and off they go. And it's going to be very quick. Looks like a 17 to 18 day leg to Brazil at this point in time, which will be one of the quickest in history. How'd you break your hand, Bicey? Oh, I had a little uh, punch up with the steering pedestal, um, but the pedestal didn't move. Yeah. Unfortunately, the uh, bones of my hand did. Right, and, and, and there, are, there are trained medics on board. It's something that everybody wants to know about. You know, what happens when there's an injury on board when you are so far? You get to Point Nemo, which is uh, f over 1,500 miles from the nearest land, and it's actually further to, it, it's further to the nearest land than it is to the space station. So you're very self-sufficient. What happens when you get an injury like that? Yeah, there, there, there's enough equipment on board, and the medics on board are trained very highly, so they know exactly what to do. In my case, I just grabbed a uh, power bar because it was so cold and that made a nice little uh, split for my hand. <laughs> just a bit of electrical tape and a power bar. <laughs> very good, nice story. Uh, right, well, it's Mototapu. Thank you very much for reminding me of the island just behind Rangitoto. 
uh, Motor Tapu, lovely place. And uh, Matt Frey now, Dong Fong now, all getting themselves set up for Southern Ocean Lake now. There's a lot of activity going on just to lure of the mast there. What's going on, Sally? So they're setting up the, the um, outrigger pole there because they're just about to, well, they're just cracked off and they need to use the pole to control the leech of the sail, to control the back of the sail on a reaching angle. And uh, it takes quite a lot of coordination if you really pay attention closely to the, to, the, to the crew on these boats to get it ready to go for these reaching offshore angles, whereas they're moving the stack around, they're getting the sheets organized, they're getting the poles out. Um, it's a very different mode of the boat than it would be um, yeah, on the inshore. And there you go, you have Brunel actually going for, I would assume, the J0, um, which is just a bigger version of the J1, uh, more powerful, and they're they're assuming they uh, they can handle that sail with the amount of breeze in their forecast. And a J0, a new a new sail in the inventory uh, brought to you by uh, North Sails. Talk to us about that uh, new innovation there, Bicey. Yeah, we, we, during the previous race, we felt there was a bit of a gap um, at that in at, in that range, and the J0 fills the gap beautifully between the uh, masthead zero and the fractional zero. So um, that fills that gap nicely, and we're seeing it being used quite efficiently, and it's a very efficient sail, and I bet there's going to get a lot of use out of it in the Southern Ocean. Uh, great pictures right now of Matt Frey, and in the foreground, look at that, uh, Steinlager 2. That is the only boat that has won all six legs in the Volvo Ocean Race, and that'll mean a lot to James Blake, the son of Sir Peter Blake, tragically killed, uh, and he was the skipper of that boat and uh, James Blake is the onboard reporter on Team Axo Nobel for this Southern Ocean leg. We had uh, uh, SJ and Pippa and their whole family down here this morning waving him off with emotional scenes, as you can imagine. And there we go, the boat, there we go, on board Axo Nobel, and there's James Blake uh, just to the right of uh, the helmsman. I think that's Chris, Chris Nicholson, I think, is driving right now, is it? We had Torben Grail, a legend of this race and a legend in sailing in every discipline. His daughter, Martine Grail, sailing there. Martine, a real boon to that team. Yeah, real strong, uh, real strong character there, and adding a lot to the team as as she, you know, finds her finds her role. I think she's new to well, not new anymore, but was new to offshore sailing during the beginning of this race and these larger boats. And I think she's really found her found her role. Yeah, look at that. Everything, everything that you can get out on the water on there. Look, there's an RS, uh, there's an RS 400 or so. We had a foiling kite board. We've got a 49er. We've got, uh, you know, uh, four knot, four knot cruising boats and uh, power boats, all sorts. And Steinlager too. There, Bruce Farr designed and Bruce Farr designed 40 boats here. Also a Kiwi and has actually taken part in a couple of these races. Look at that. <laughs> Great pictures. One, some of those still shots. I'm sure they'll be taking for little mementos for your bathroom wall. Dong, like, Dong, yeah, go yeah it looks like Dong Feng's going to go for their J zero as well. They see Brunel really charging behind them. But uh, you know, it's interesting because Brunel made the made the change on the turn. The J one is the hard, one of the hardest sails to peel from because you have to have all hands on the bow there to, to drag it in and. Um, this change might be costly for, a little bit costly for Dong Feng as they are doing it on a, a tight reaching angle. Now that's the, just to the left is great picture right there of the, of, of, of the, um, of the pole, the outrigger. The outrigger, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see how it's, you basically lead the sheet through it or you lead it through a carabiner or something to, to out, to pull it outboard. You, like, um, for those scow sailors back at home, it would be like a barber hauler, basically, to to hold the leech of the sail out and down for a better shape on the reaching angle. Yeah, Takapuna Beach in the background. And they'll be going up towards uh, Castor Bay, Murray's Beach. So they head up towards all of these North Shore beaches of Auckland. Let's let's go let's go up to Richard Mason. Uh, uh, Richard, uh, give us your perspective of this these amazing scenes. All these spectator boats, Steinlager too. Every every bathtub they can get out on the water. Kiwis have brought it today. 
oh, it makes you feel super proud. I'm almost getting a bit emotional up here, you know, new age guy in the helicopter and all, knowing what they're going through now. They've got through the inner, the racing in the inner harbour. They'll be starting to think what lies ahead now. Really interested to see Maffrey starting to kick her heels up, you know, she's starting to go. And of course there was Steinlein, quite, they would be dressed about the same, they'd have the same sails up, so you can really get a feel of just how much quicker these more modern yachts are. The Steinlager would have been carrying uh, probably 14 to 16 crew and had over 22 sails on board. They even had a cook on there, I think, uh, at one point. So a very, very different type of racing. But uh, it's wonderful to see all those different types of boats out there, get a feeling of where our sport has come from. And the, uh, the wide amount of harbour in New Zealand, absolutely spectacular. Really a wonderful, wonderful view. And I'm, I'm getting a view now out over the Hauraki Gulf and into Colville Channel. And it looks like underneath these clouds there's some good breeze out there. So uh, we'll be seeing these boats starting to hunker down. They'll be getting a good taste of it pretty early on in the, uh, in the evening this evening. Yeah, Richard, it looks like the breeze has been steadily building as they've come around Rangitoto right now. We, this is the top of Rangitoto right now, as if the helicopter man knew where I was going with that. And they're all right on the top there, waving at us from that uh, super volcano. Yeah, look at the, the sheep in the paddock, that is for sure. There's plenty of breeze out there as we pan around to see all the boats leaving. And you can see that Steinlager too. You can still see her iconic right there, just sailing along with the fleet, like the, the, the old lady of the fleet, just uh, giving her blessing. The word. There we go. Matt Frey leading. What a scene. Look at that. Auckland Harbour Bridge right in the background there. Takapuna and all the North Shore beaches. All seven boats right there as they head out from Auckland, the gateway to the Southern Ocean. Matt Frey lead, and it's very much Matt Frey leading. Dong Fong in second, Brunel in third, time the tide on plastic in fourth, Axo Nobel in fifth, in sixth, Vestas 11th hour racing, and in seventh right now, Sun Hung Kai Scallywag. I suspect we'll see the Scallywags put the pedal down a little bit because we had plenty from. Uh, we had plenty in the press conference from uh, David Witt. He was, what, what would you call it, punchy? Punchy, yeah. <laughs> Gutsy, or however you want to say. He really wasn't going to let up, is he? He's going to push that boat as hard as he can all the way through the Southern Ocean. Dee Kafari with her trademark stance there. Sam Greenfield, the onboard reporter, one of the very finest, just behind her, recording everything for posterity. That's Rangitoto Lighthouse. Wonderful. Now all those kiteboarders come out for Rangitoto to... Built in 1882, that lighthouse, just to keep sailors safe as they came come in towards Auckland Harbour. The traditional red and white candy stripes on the lighthouse. That's the Tony Monk, a wonderful helicopter pilot, doing a great job. Been really brilliant getting some of these pictures, both from the arrivals and the departures here. There we go, Dong Fong starting to really get that thoroughbred racehorse moving. The arrivals was amazing, wasn't it, Sally? Two minutes apart, so close, and we've seen plenty of close finishes into Auckland, but it, it, it really was spectacular. Axel Nobel on the up and up doing a great job. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Unfortunately for us uh, on Brunel, we were a little bit further behind the group, but uh, heard the stories from the front pack, and yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it goes to show one design fleet, the boats get spread out on the ocean, and then yeah, everybody's pushing so hard that you have a chance to fight back, and um, yeah, I think it pretty pretty awesome. Great shot of Matt Frey, all powered up, and uh, those those rigid inflatable boats next to them, they they are doing a solid 20 knots, and those falling kite boarders keeping up. Don't get in the way there, folks. But Matt Frey starting to just put the pedal down, starting to t t to twist the screws a little bit and get this thing going. Yeah, you really see them like they're the first ones to get the, the J3, which is the smaller sail there inside the J1 in the main sail. That's been locked in since they turned the corner. Their stack is in the right place. You don't see people moving around, and the boat's just ready to rip. That stack, I mean, it, it looks like a wedding cake right there. There's so <laughs> many layers of it. Yeah, max beam, we say. So it's when you can get the stack there at the max beam of the boat, hey guys. yeah, it's going to create guys. The, the most riding moment. 
And ten times the Spanish have challenged for the Volvo Ocean Race, never won it. Is this the time they can do it, Sally? Yeah, let's let's not jinx them, but I'm pretty sure that this this could be their moment. They're uh, they, time and time again, they're showing how strong they are as a team, how smart they are when they need to make you know either conservative or push you know push the boat a bit to make certain decisions like the 20 or 40 or how many ever jibes they did along the ice skates in the last Southern Ocean to win to the to the great start they they just pulled and here on the import. Yeah, and Chavi the skippers won a gold and a silver medal in the uh, 04 and 08 Olympics in the 49er. Very accomplished. This is his fifth Volvo Ocean race. How does he have time for it all? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, they've got they've got an extremely accomplished team. Uh, Rob Greenhouse as well on board. Tamara Echigoyen, we were talking about her earlier. The gold medal winner from London. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a really strong team. The they have the deepest team in the field, I think, with the most experience from last race, combining together and putting it and putting a really, you know, a very dynamic team. I think Shabby's a he's a leader by example, from what I know, and he really, you know, is always in the mix. Not always the one driving, not always the one being the hero, but the one keeping the team together. Okay, we'll get up to Richard Mason. Richard, just talk to us about Matt Frey, how good they look, and whether. Uh, Dong Fong can get back into them and take a chunk out of them in this leg. Oh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a pretty straight line at the moment, and uh, I'm very much with Sally on that one. They look very settled. The boat looks beautifully set up. It's a good thing about being in a helicopter. You get to see the sail trim from all angles. We're sitting right in front of it at the moment. It's, uh, it just shows all the signs of the Welsh team. They were the first team to get going, training for the race. Volvo race is all about preparation and teamwork. It's not about the individual. And uh, what I'm seeing down there is a class act. And uh, I think what Sally said, you know, Shabby's one of these guys who's always been around. He commands respect, but he earns it. You know, he doesn't ask for it. And uh, you can see him, uh, he's putting the right guys in the right place. And that's the result down there, a slick red yacht. It must be something about red boats leaving Auckland. They seem to, we seem to leave here first on a regular basis. Yeah, well, you both have given a nice, uh, nice uh, big up to Matt Frey, but I've got to say, Dongfong race team were down at their base this morning before anybody else appeared. They've got an accomplished team, and this is one they really want to win. Uh, Charles Cordrelia said in the press conference he'd been round the horn twice, but neither time had he had his mast up. So this time they are going to do it, and I'm sure they're going to push Matt Frey very hard. They had game faces on. Can Dongfong squeeze at them? They've certainly, they've certainly tried, Richard. Yeah, absolutely. We're just going over the top of them at the moment again. You know, they were the second team to get going. Actually, Dong Fong and Maffrey trained against one another a lot uh, pre-race. Pre and uh, I've got a sneaky feeling they might have found a few little edges that the other teams are only just getting a hold of now and the way to set the boats up, how to use the uh, keel systems and, uh, and trim the whole boat out. But like you said, if you want to uh, win this race, you've got to ring around Cape Horn with your mast up. It helps, I can assure you. <laughs> And Richard, just talk to us about the different setups right now, because we just had we just had Matt Frey with the two sails at the front, and now we've got Dong Fong with the masthead uh, masthead up. Talk to us about that. Exactly. So uh, with Matt Frey there with the staysail, and the, you're achieving a similar sort of sail area, but the centre of effort's down a little bit. Uh, so we'll see. There's a tighter wind angle, so if the wind's a little ahead of them, they're going to be a bit better set up there. The, if you're looking here, Matt Frey's a little more upright, a little more controlled. And of course, Dong Fong with that masthead sail area, it's a higher up, so it pushes the boat over more, pushes it into its maximum healing and riding moments. That's what these boats are all about, trying to generate as much power as you can. So uh, slightly different setups there, and each boat will have its moment. But right now, you'd, you'd uh, started to pick on a broken nose, you know, there's nothing in it. Wonderful. Okay, well, Matt Frey lead over Dong Fong race team. Can Dong Fong race team get back into Matt Frey in this 7,600 mile leg? That's the jeopardy that exists in front of them. Can they get around safely and can they balance pushing the boat with getting ahead of Matt Frey, who they desperately want to be? And if they do, it's remember, it's a double points leg. So if you win, you get double seven, which is 14. You get you go around the horn first, you get an extra point, that's 15, and then you get a bonus point for winning the leg, so that's 16. And if you come second, you get twice uh, six, so that's 12. So there is a four point difference between the winner and the second place, if all works out for you. And Matt Frey only five points ahead of Dong Fong race team. I spoke this morning with uh, 
uh, Bruno Dubois, the syndicate head of this Chinese team, and he was game face for sure. He said his boys and girls can do it. They are very experienced round the world sailors. Okay, to Brunel. And now just uh, Richard, if you can still hear us, uh, talk to us about the setup on Brunel and turn the tide on plastic. We've got great pictures of them from your helicopter. Yeah, we're in a fantastic position here. We're sitting straight over the top of uh, Dong Fong. They're going past us with the, the Masthead Zero and the outrigger on to lure it. That's, uh, that's like a carbon pole that helps push the sail away from the boat. Then on uh, Brunel, they're using a similar sail. And uh, so their same setup as Dong Fong. And then turn the tide on plastics. They're set up in the same mode as Maffrey, so and they're really just powering along. This is almost the optimum point of sail for these boats, fully powered up, reaching along in flat water. And they're kicking along here. I mean, uh, you know, we've got some powerful uh, ribs and things down here, and they're going flat out to keep up with them. They, they'll be sitting on 22 knots. So really fantastic to see them kicking their heels up. Yeah, yeah, beautiful pictures. 20, 20, 20 to 2, 20 to 22, easy here. And they've got uh, both of the boards up there, Sally. Yeah, that's because they don't need the actual lift in the water. So you might as well have no drag. And that's really what's going on there. They're at a wide enough angle to the wind that they want the boat just to surf over the water and not have any, uh, have any extra drag. And um, yeah, that's what those boards are doing. Yeah, well, thanks to all of our fans who are watching on Facebook Live, on Twitter, and all of our channels that we're pushing this out on. It's great to have you all just remind us where you're watching from, which team you're supporting. Uh, they all love it. They all get your messages, I can promise you. And uh, Kiwis all around the northern beaches here enjoying a great view. And look at that. This is the final turning mark. Uh, I think this is the final turning mark before they head off uh, towards the East Cape. 180 miles directly into the breeze. Maybe they've got one more here along the, uh, uh, along the North Shore. Mark number five. There we go. Matt Frey charging along. And Dong Fong race team just behind them. Then it's Brunel. Then turn the tide on plastic. Then Team Axo Nobel. Then Vestas 11th Hour Racing. It just had that slight little mishap uh, in the import section of this race, but they seem to have got their act together now. It's great to have Vestas 11th Hour Racing back on. A brilliant job by all of those in the boatyard, Bicey and his team getting us that seventh boat back in the hunt. Oh, be beautiful. Final clearing bow mark. Right, bow right. Oh, yeah, fantastic as Xavi Fernandez takes the boat around and they trim their sails on. And these are the final moments. This is when and friends and family... Oh, look at that. Uh, so there's going to be a furl up on board Dong Fong. Talk us through this, Sally. Yeah, so this next mark, they need to actually turn it up into the wind. So they are no, gonna, no longer going to be able to hold this bigger J0. And I suspect it as much. They're going to go for this change. They've hoisted the J1 inside the J0. Then you can furl up the J0 because it's on the it's on the masthead lock and the, and the prod there makes it an easier an easier change. But they will still make a loss. You saw them have to bear away there and sail just a little extra distance. I mean, we're not talking much because they're about to go, you know, 6,000 plus odd miles offshore. But it's still uh, an extra maneuver that maybe they didn't have to do on this little short leg. On board, on board. Let's listen in while we can. A little bit of a problem there, Sally. Yeah, a lot of a lot of coordination and a lot of communication needed. They're trying to drop the J zero basically, and so you have to give a little bit of a luff to fling it around the, the front of the of the J one, so front of the head stay, and uh, that takes coordination from the, the driver to the pit to the bow. And they haven't quite got it around. They're sort of trying to drag it around the. Is that a halyard? At the, that's the four stay, right? At the front. That's the four stay at the front. Uh, so they've gone with their J two, uh, which is also pretty interesting. A much smaller sail, so they've made quite a big choice. Right, so a much smaller sail than Matt Frey had in front of them. But now look at this, the breeze and the waves starting to really take their action in. This is just the start of what they're going to get for the next 18 days. They reckon it's 11 days. I had my, my uh, 
every event weather briefing from Anderson Reggio, Ooh, uh, who gives me an update. We'll keep on these pictures, so everyone trying to do the same here. But turn the tide on plastic coming right into Team Brunel. And so this is this is what happens when you change sails, then, Sally. Exactly. You just lose boat lengths, and it just depends on how well you do it. You're going to lose something. If you do it extremely well, you're not going to lose that much. But you just saw that turn the tide didn't change anything, and they just came roaring up into Brunel as they're trying to sort out their sails. Right. And Brunel now, and they've both got the same sail up. It's a J, J1, is that? Yep, I think they both have the J1 there. And uh, just look like Don Feng went for the J2, and they'll get rid of those outrigger poles because now they're cho choosing that upwind angle. Okay, so the final turning mark before these teams head upwind. Oh, yeah, here we go. Well, that's what happens if you don't manage to get it around the force day, right? You actually have to go up there and manually do it. Kevin Escoffier and Jackson Boutel, both of them. Oh, that is wet and hard work right there right at the beginning of the leg. Yeah, super hard work. Like, let's remember, yeah, it's the, a little bit bigger than the jib, but it's a full masthead hoist. So it's a very long and narrow sail. It's still quite heavy. And when it's dragging to lure like that, it's uh, quite an effort to get it around. That's how more it's supposed to look. It's supposed to be inside the, the actual jib or the J1. And then it's still hard work to flake it into the bag there. But to have to drag it all the way around the force day is a bit of a mishap. T Max o Nobel going around there. They've got uh, James Blake. We just got a picture of him uh, doing some of his wonderful work videoing the teams as they went around this final turning mark. And uh, Axo Nobel have painted all of these boats. So they've, had, they've got a real. There we go. That's how to do it, right? Perfect. That's how to do it. Nice coordination, but you still have to bear away a little bit. Two to three guys on the bow is what you need to get that sail packed away really quickly into the bag. And as soon as you can get it flaked up right that, that, that's what they're doing right there. that's what they're doing they're flaking it in the bag and then uh, you'll notice that the tack it's still out on the front of the boat there so the bowman needs to go all the way out there pull it back unhook it and then they can complete it all the way into the bag and put it on the stack and then they're done I sailed with these guys on Thursday Nick Dana uh, was doing a great job on the bow and Tom Johnson was talking me through a whole bunch of the things that were going on we had a lovely time and I've sailed with sci-fi in the past and uh, here in Auckland and Tony Mutter, in fact, are good, great guys, and they've really done a good job of getting back into this. Hannah Diamond, uh, 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 what do you call her? Diamond in the Rough? Diamond. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure she would. Yeah, no, I think so. <laughs> uh, she was, she's great and really relishing the opportunity and has really stepped up to the plate on this team. For sure. You know, she has a strong background in shorter core sailing, you know, dipped into the Olympic sailing scene then pushed herself really hard to, to get on this boat, and both in the gym and with opportunities to be on the water on any bigger boat that she could. Yeah, Vestas 11th Hour Racing did it perfectly. Well, it was very nice of us to be able to talk about how to get that uh, furling uh, zero down, and some of the boats did it well, some not so well, and then we got Vestas just to sh show us exactly how it should be done. Just bear away, heal the boat to windward a bit, and get that zero on the windward side. Sun Hung Kai's scallywag. <coughs> They're muscling it around right there. And they're the final boat to go around this last turning mark. Auckland, New Zealand, the city of sails. What a great time it's been. But boy, plenty of plenty of jeopardy to come for all of these boats. Can Sun Hunkai Scallywag repeat their form? Right now, they're in bottom spot. T on board, turn the tide. Let's take a look. This is a bow camera right here. That just gives you an idea of how cold and wet this is going to be. Looks like maybe how something. Mu how, much wanna, how much want to be there, Sally? <laughs> i got to be honest with you. <laughs> Not very much. Pretty happy st sitting next to you today, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, uh, if we've still got Bicey, let's go down to Bicey. Give us some thoughts about uh, these boats heading off into the Southern Ocean, Bicey. <laughs> Richard Mason, uh, give us your thoughts about these boats as they head off up the northern beaches and then down towards uh, the Southern Ocean. Well, you think what lies ahead of them. They've got the liquid Himalayas. Uh, probably the most iconic geographical position in the world is sailing in Cape Horn. They're going to go down to 55 south. That's probably the furthest this fleet of boats has been in the last two or three editions because there's not a lot of ice this year. 
Uh, so really, you know, they're going into the heart of what this yacht race is all about. And you know the wonderful thing about this yacht race, it doesn't matter if you come first or last, when you're standing at the finish line back in Europe, you've just sailed around the world, so everyone's a winner. Absolutely magical, and you've got to say a huge yeah. thank you to the New Zealand public for hosting the race here. It truly is a wonderful place to bring the race, and just so much knowledge and feeling amongst the people. So I'm sure all these sailors, you know, they'll, they'll be uh, starting to think about drawing themselves out and what lies ahead here, looking up into the wind. Colville Channel, just, you can just see it in the distance, the Coromandel Peninsula. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be quite a long afternoon for them as they beat out of the Hauraki Golf and then head down to East Cape. Yeah, it looks like we've got one more turning mark to go before the boats uh, then turn right on the uh, full upwind. So that's mark number six that Matt Frey are getting towards. And uh, Richard, we just have pictures there of Sun Hunkai Scallywag right now at the back. But if we take the scores from the last three legs, Sun Hunkai Scallywag on top of the leaderboard. They've had the best results. Uh, they were first into Hong Kong and then second down here into Auckland. Uh, can they repeat this amazing feat on and their charge up the leaderboard? Oh, I think uh, that's the beauty of yacht racing, isn't it? Anything's possible with thousands of miles to go. But uh, like you said there, uh, old Dave was uh, pretty punchy in the uh, press conference yesterday saying he was either he was either going to win the leg or break the boat trying. And uh, the Southern Ocean is about managing risk and uh, keeping everything in one piece and seamanship. And so it's, uh, it's anyone's there, but uh, you know, definitely it's a very skilled set of sailors out there and anything's possible. So I wish them all the very, very best of luck. I hope they can do well. And uh, we'll, we'll see uh, we see who pulls it out of the bag. Yeah, and we've got Vestas 11th Hour Racing. We've just passed them. Uh, a, an amazing job for them to get the boat back and ready. Can they get back into the hunt? Will they be pushing as hard as they did when uh, they, 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 they left? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the Vestas has got Tony Mudder on board. He's a race winner himself. Uh, I think his, uh, his history goes all the way back to Mira Cup. So he uh, won the race in Avian Ambro. Uh, he's, uh, he's at home in the Southern Ocean. He knows how to drive hard. He knows how to keep it on his feet. So the combination of that, you've got Phil Harmer. He won the race on Drew Palmer. So, you know, really, uh, they, they've got some pretty quick helmsmen. They know what it takes to uh, come back. That's what this yacht race is all about. So, Recovering from disasters and turning it into victory, and they'll do it well, I promise you. Yeah, great. Wonderful words. Thank you, Richard Mason. This is the final turning mark now, uh, the white Volvo mark, as Matt Frey now start to wind on, and we'll see quite a different setup now as they start to go upwind. Talk us through that, Sally. That's right. Let the slamming begin. You saw this <laughs> as soon as they turned up, the bow just slamming into the waves, and that's going to be their mode now for quite a while as they're just going to have to beat up into the wind and the waves are already quite big. Yeah, they've gone from thoroughbred racehorses to a hobby horse here, bump, uh, nodding donkeys up and down the bow, <laughs> smashing into the waves. Uh, day after day, what does it feel like? Uh, it is relentless, you know, and you have to live life on board there, soaking wet, pounding, the loud noises are incredible. The effort you have to put in is, is astounding and, you know, hats off to every one of these sailors that are about to take it on. Oh, Matt Frey really, got, really pulled out quite a significant lead right there. And that was what you and Richard were both talking about. If we've still got Richard Mason. Richard, that was their setup there. Uh, Matt Frey pulled out a pretty decent lead. Yeah, they, they pulled out a beautiful lead. You've got to remember that every time you change sails on these boats, it's, uh, it's a hell of an effort and it actually slows you down. So every time you change a sail, you're losing distance. And they've just played it cool. They've figured out which sail is going to be uh, paying the best averages. They stayed on their J2 here. It looks nice and twisted and open. They come around and uh, just they pulled it on the wind there. Plenty of power in the boat and just uh, starting to thump their way into it. I think a few of the boys start, might start feeling lunch soon. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to feel lunch too soon, that's for sure. And it does, it does get bumpy. And I, I've asked a few of the sailors, oh, great pictures on board Dong Fong. Let's listen. They've got their full offshore kit on. Yeah, they're ready to go. They're feeling the pain of being on this J2 versus the J1. As you see, Brunel just yeah, pushing a stern of them. So what do they do? How do they, can they change it? They can, but it's going to be quite a big loss and a change. They're just anticipating, which I think you see there, the breeze increasing as you're going upwind. The J2 is going to be probably a much more balanced sail as they actually turn this mark. 
and they don't have to go for a change when it you know pumps up to 35 40 knots look at that pirate ship in the background there's pirates all over the haraki gulf today great stuff dong fong definitely under a bit of pressure there from brunel yeah. so those boats that boat that we just saw that was you know that's a sort of clipper rig that's a square rigger and that was part of the inspiration for this race was those clipper boats all going around Cape Horn before they built the Panama Canal Cape Horn was you know ah, where passage, yeah. yeah right where you had to go unavoid unavoidable and now uh, it's uh, Panama Canal has made it much easier commercially but sailors and racers still do it and cruisers and racers alike it is a bucket list event to go around Cape Horn and these sailors all off on their way around Cape Horn there we go, D giving it a final wave there. And uh, she always has special something for the right. She, she does something right at the right moment, old D, always. And always with a smile, Sally. Always with a smile and always something positive to say, but in, but in real words, you know, it's never a fake D. She's just, yeah, and she loves being out there. She's just gonna be coming into her own the next couple of days. And a big responsibility for her as she takes what is, I guess, less of a new crew now. Most of them have been blooded after six legs here. This leg seven to Itaji, Brazil. Dong Fong just leading over, Bru Bru uh, Dong Fong in second over Brunel in third. Turn the tide on plastic in fourth. This, this, if, if, every moment of these, when they can, you can do well on the import race, when you can do well on the leg departure, all helps the attitude and uh, it sets the tone, right? It does, and it gives energy to the crew as well. Don't Let's not forget, these crew are maxed out. Yeah, they've just had a, a bit of a battery recharge here in New Zealand, but, you know, they're in for a huge effort, each as an individual. And when you are when you have the positive energy of a team from winning or leading or doing a good maneuver or a good change, it all adds to how much you can push the boat together. Interestingly, Axel Nobel, slightly different stack setup to Matt Frey. They've sort of got the stack of a little longer and Matt Frey had it all layered up in a foot four high. Yeah, I, I have the feeling that Matt Frey were set up for, for this turning mark. They were just set up for the long haul. They're set up for their upwind mode, which is max beam stack. They, st they stayed on the J1. They weren't too worried about the outrigger. Uh, whereas everybody else pushed a little bit in the in the reaching angles and changed a bit and maybe didn't make the gains that they were looking for. Yeah, Matt Frey got the pedal down and here we are with Festus 11th hour racing. Look like they've... Uh, Come through a bit of a cloud of seaweed there. They've got seaweed all over the front of the boat and some of it got down to the back of the boat. They've taken a few big waves over the bow. <laughs> it might be the uh, well wishes from... There you go, Neptune's <laughs> well wishes, very good. Uh, <coughs> Vestas 11th hour racing coming around. This final turning mark, mark number six, as they head upwind on the last boat here, Sun Hung Kai Scallywag. Can they repeat the amazing performance for their last two legs? And uh, just to give us a perspective on the breeze, the waves, uh, Richard Mason, thoughts? Yeah, I'm seeing as uh, we're going to stick with the theme of the day, there's a lot more sheep coming in the paddock out here. I'd say there's a reasonably solid 20 to 25 knots uh, all the way up the racetrack. We're right behind uh, Sung Hung Gai at the moment. Actually, an old mate of mine, Tom Braidwood, just uh, flew in off Broadway to join that crew. Uh, we were on Ericsson 1 together. He's another, uh, he loves the Southern Ocean, so he's come back for that one. He'll be uh, great for David. But really, all the boats are on a long starboard tack here. They'll go out to the uh, corner of Whangaparaa Peninsula, which you can see in the background. Turi Turi Martangi, the island on the left. And uh, they'll start beating their way out to uh, Colville Channel. Now the tide will be, uh, by the time they get there, the tide will be against the wind. So that'll be pushing the seas up a fair bit. So uh, uh, around 6 o'clock tonight, they'll be going through there. It'll be some quite spectacular photos, I think. And uh, you know, they have to be careful taking the boats through. They don't break something as they get through and then start clearing out for uh, East Cape there. So it's a beautiful scene here. Perfect breeze, perfect conditions. That's what these boats are built for. Well, we've got plenty of Kiwis watching, and I'm sure some of them will get down to Great Barrier Island and they'll get onto the East Cape. I've uh, toured around the East Capes, one of the undiscovered beauties of New Zealand, in my view, and uh, in, uh, it, it we'll get lots of people, I'm sure, over the next 24 hours getting out there and watching and taking their boats out to watch the teams. Here we go, Sun Hunkai Scallywag going around that uh, final mark. Ooh, it doesn't look like we'll just stick. We'll just stick with this for a moment because uh, 
That's not good, Sally. What's going on there? Yep, I'm hoping they're going for a change unless they just lost their halyards. Uh, ah, they've gone for a change. Oh, so yeah. this is what I was talking about, super hard change. They've gone for the hardest change I think ever to do on these sails, which is when you have the J2 up and you have to drag this J1 down on the deck, very tight quarters there behind the J2 and the actual lifelines, which is where you see the bag stacked. You need to get about six more people on the bow to actually do this whole uh, thing correctly. Right, it doesn't roll up. It doesn't roll up, it just drops down on the hanks on the on the front and uh, it's heavy and it's wet and there you go, they're just dragging it in in the uh, in the boat there and maybe they're just a bit behind and getting enough people up on the bow. Looks like David Witt's gonna have to buy his bow team around when they get uh, around, <laughs> a, around a beers when they get, or maybe Caipirinas when they get into uh, Itaji, Brazil. Look at that, all the young oaks on the bow of Sun Hung Kai Scalliwag getting it in there so no major problems but perhaps just interesting insight into the tactical options when it comes to different sails. Let's take a look at the weather that the boats are going to experience over the next few days and a couple of weeks as we go towards Brazil and as I said 180 miles straight upwind to the East Cape and then it's a dive south and they've got to go further south than they thought because there's a high pressure system just above them and the uh, ice exclusion zone is there but it's down at 59 degrees so a lot further south than we've ever seen before and then they go squeeze in between the ice gate and Cape Horn, Cape Horn at nearly 57 degrees south, turn left and Cape Horn and then it's up across the eastern side of South America past Chile and into Itaji, Brazil. And we had some, uh, a couple of days, uh, yesterday we had the press conference for all of the skippers and we got some quite interesting comments from them as Sally and I have referenced today. Let's take a listen. I suppose we're going into the most iconic, probably the, one of the more gruelling uh, legs of the race, uh, heading down, um, down to the, some uh, pretty cold parts of the world, but I think we're all uh, you know, pretty excited to head to you know, one of the, the more um, remote parts of the planet. It's going to be pretty cool to get down there. We had a, an ocean last time. And, um, you know, it's going to be good to get back. And obviously, we've got an amazing team on Matt Free. So, yeah, really looking forward to it. This leg will be pretty interesting for my guys. I think we'll probably either win the leg or drop the rig. This is a big chance for Scallywag to actually stay there and do something or drop back towards the back of the pack. So, we don't care if anything comes. We don't care how, what, what goes wrong and what breaks. We're just going to send it. You know, we only can do one thing, which is uh, push the ball, say well, and try to win this leg, which, which is going to be a, a big step forward if we... If we can't do it. So. Sometimes you have to forget the race and uh, just uh, take care of the boat and the, of the crew, you know. So, and I know it very well because uh, I've done two times uh, this leg and I never finish with a mast up. You can't ignore where you're going and the responsibility that lies with the skipper on board. But the difference in this edition of the race is leg three. Everyone's had a taste of how wet, cold and windy it can be. It's probably the best sailing what you can, ha can get. We know the boats now so well, so we will push 100%. Definitely going to be a challenging one. You know, it's leaving your home port, going into some pretty big seas. The team has come together great. The repair has come together great. Uh, you know, there's 16 points available during this leg. And to put it into context, we have 23 right now. So it's going to be a big move and a big shake. It's been a, a big improvement and a big learning curve for in, in our team as well. And, and I think the, on the shore and on board, everyone is working unbelievable hard, and we hope to keep that momentum going. And the leg win here in uh, in, in Auckland uh, basically proved that we're on the right track. Well, Sally, amazing. Final thoughts for this leg? Yeah, we know that uh, each and every one of these sailors are ready for this challenge, and uh, they're prepared, and they're going to push the boats. And I just wish them the, the safest safest leg they can have. Well, thanks. I'm Andy Green, and thanks to everyone for tuning in around the world. It's been quite a stopover and quite a start here for the leg. Thanks also to the ever-amusing Nick Bice and Richard Mason up in the helicopter. We've had a great couple of weeks in New Zealand, and fantastic to see the race fans, and they all consider Auckland, I guess, a spiritual home for the Volvo Ocean Race. But before we wrap up, it was uh, International Women's Day during the Auckland stopover, a feature of this edition been the rules and the incentive to encourage women in the sailing teams creating mixed crews on every boat now something of a standard. really good they're all unique individuals collectively inspirational 
for women in sport and as a dad of girls significant to everyone anyway already changing perceptions fast becoming a brand new breed of ocean racing heroes these women let's hear a little bit about it we live in a world where everything is retouched cropped edited resized photoshopped filtered but where we go none of that matters in the Volvo ocean race there is no filter Growing up, I was often the only girl in my sailing classes. And I was told that I wasn't heavy enough or strong enough like the boys, so I couldn't be competing with them. So all my life, people have been telling me that I'm crazy and that what I'm doing is impossible. You're often underestimated, not really taken very seriously. I think being a girl or being a boy is not the point. It's uh, about what you do, what, what you perform on the water. People always ask me how tough a Volvo Ocean race is. Just as mentally challenging, if not more, uh, than it is physically challenging. You eat and you're still racing, you sleep and you're still racing. And there's definitely times where you question yourself, why on earth am I out here? In some of your dark moments, you're definitely questioning if you're tough enough, smart enough, fit enough to even be there. If it was easy, everybody would do it. When you're on the water, the only thing that matters is how fast you're going. When I leave the dock and I step on the boat, a light switch goes. I grew up with boys and I had many uh, men idols, but it wasn't until recently that I started having female idols. The fact that we get to inspire the next sailors is really special. I just hope that we're doing a good job. To keep updated, download the app, comment on Facebook, share on Instagram, and follow us on Twitter. The raw content comes straight from the boats and is on the website and the app, and it's one of my favorites. The team in Alicante will keep you updated on all the latest action with the ever knowledgeable race experts. Every day, the quick fix and the daily show will be brought to you by our presenter, Niall Mayant-Best, and round the world sailor, Conrad Coleman. As always, Niall and I are gonna be bringing you all of the latest and greatest stories from the Volvo Ocean Race, direct from race headquarters in Alicante. So don't forget to tune back in at 0800 UTC for the quick fix, and at 1300 UTC for all of the latest analysis and details and interviews with the boats. Now, the race has started, it was a cracker of a start. So, our best, Hurry on. Now, <clears throat> no, I hate it when I'm late, so don't worry, buddy. I'm coming. <clears throat> uh, don't worry, sweetie. I'm coming. I'm coming. Here we go. Over 7,600 nautical miles of mountainous waves, treacherous seas, boats and bodies, only moments from disaster. Gales, icebergs, and with the double points at stake, as a symbol of the struggle, a bonus point for rounding Cape Horn in first. This is Life at the Extreme. 